one night Adam stayed out very late, and uh, Eve got pretty upset about it. In fact, this wasn't the first time. And uh, when he got home, she said, you're running around with another woman, aren't you? Adam said, well, that's ridiculous. You're the only girl for me. In fact, come to think of it, you're the only girl. And so the quarrel continued until the early morning hours, and uh, finally Adam was just exhausted, and, and he fell asleep. And it wasn't very long until he, he woke up later to find Eve poking him in the side. He looked at her and he said, what do you think you're doing? Counting your ribs, she said. In our first study on marriage last time, we discovered the purpose of marriage as is revealed in Genesis chapter 2. The purpose of marriage is to solve the problem of loneliness. Do you remember the very first thing that God said about marriage? A fourth grade Sunday school class was meeting, and, and the teacher asked the same question. She said, who knows what God said about marriage? One little guy held up his hand, and the, the teacher said, okay, Tommy, what did he say? He said, well, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. <laughs> Well, the first thing that God ever said about marriage is in verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Now, some versions say helpmate or suitable helper, but the literal translation is this way. A help of his life was not found. A help of his life was not found. He, so he needed a helper, someone contemporary with him, someone like him, someone that he could den- identify with. Verse 21 says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman. Now, just as a footnote here, the rib rib cage is the protective agent of the most vital organs of the human body, the lungs and the heart. When God made a woman, he took her from the rib cage And there you will see something that God has given women that men do not have. And that is a very protective instinct. It is just built in, intuitive, God-given to women. And it is such a beautiful thing. C.S. Lewis said, if you don't believe it, just suppose that your dog bites a little kid down the street. Would you rather face the mother or the father when you talk to them? When God made woman, he made a very unique person. The end of verse 22 says, and he brought her to the man. So God made prime rib from the man, and then he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. We saw last time that everything that the New Testament says about what you are to do in the marriage is based on what God first said at this first marriage. In other words, the teachings on marriage in Ephesians chapter 5, 1 Peter 3, 1 Corinthians 7, and so on, all show us how to fulfill what God first said about marriage right here. And here we have another instance of that in verse 23. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And it shows us from the very beginning that man in God's plan is the initiator and the woman is the responder. And that is why you find in the New Testament, Ephesians 5.25, it says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. And regardless of what our culture says and regardless of how it is practiced, God has made man to be the initiator and the woman to be the responder. And we are going to see how understanding that and grasping that and living that is key to the whole marriage when we come to Ephesians chapter 5. And the basis for it is established right here in the first marriage. Now, in verse 24, we have the very first instruction that God gave regarding marriage. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. We saw last time that there needs to be a physical, that is a geographical leaving, a financial uh, leaving, an emotional leaving of your parents. In fact, the word leaves mean to abandon. It says that you are to abandon your mother and your father. Now, does that mean that we are to snub them? No. Does that mean not to honor them? No. God has given us another word on that. In fact, one of the Ten Commandments is honor your father and your mother. Go to them for counsel? Yes. Ask their wisdom? Certainly. Be nice to them and love them? Definitely. All the days of their life? Yes. 
but they are to leave, abandon their mother and their father. And you know, that is tough for some people. It can really be difficult. I think every leaving is tough. And I think that that, that is one reason that Jesus repeats this in the New Testament, Matthew 19, 5, when he's teaching about marriage and he says the very same thing. He goes all the way back to where Moses quotes this same thing, leave, forsake, abandon your mother and your father, but not in respect and not in honor and not in counsel. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. The old King James says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife. Be united to your wife. That means for life. That that word is like glue. Stick to it for life till death parts you. Now, in the, in the Anglican wedding vows, one of the last things it says is, I will be faithful to you until death do us part. Every marriage begins with four words. Will you marry me? But far too many marriages are ending with four words. I want a divorce. And I believe because people are not careful enough with the first four words, they become far too careless with the last four words. These four words, I want a divorce, are four words God never intended to ever be heard in a marriage. Today, people do not see marriage as a lifetime commitment, but rather as a 90-day option. The prevailing attitude is, if the first marriage fails, just keep marrying until you get it right. I mean, whatever happened to, uh, to till death do us part? Today it's till debt or till disappointment or till disillusionment do us part. When two people, a man and a woman, come together for the purpose of marriage, God intends for them to be welded together permanently. God's law is one man and one, lo- and one wife for one life. That is the way that marriage is supposed to be. You are glued together, you see. It is a lifelong commitment. No back door, ever. Lifelong commitment. And that is one of the reasons why the courtship should be a godly, Holy Spirit-led courtship. After years of counseling married couples, I really believe that the divorce starts before the marriage begins, for the most part. The seeds are planted there. What happens in the courtship and how you handle that has a lot to do with what is going to happen later on. And I want to say to you who are married that you want to be very careful that you never use the word, you never bring up the word divorce in your marriage. Because once you start talking about it, you're starting to open that back door. And you can say, you know, I don't believe in divorce, but if you don't shape up, you know, and those type of things, and now you've started. And before you know it, one of the or the other of you will be walking through that back door and it will be heartbreaking to you and you never thought that it could happen to you. Now, let me say something here about divorce. Divorce is the ultimate goal or result of the enemy's plan. Do you know why? Well, the reasons for it are many, but basically it is for your crippling and and destruction as an individual. You want to really take a look at whoever you're going to marry if you're thinking about getting married because uh, because of what divorce will do to you if you do not do this right. If you don't base your marriage on divine principles that we're going to be seeing in the next several studies. Let me paint the picture for you. A person that goes through a divorce usually goes through a year or two or three maybe some five years or more of a troubled relationship before they ever get to the point where they decide to get a divorce. And in that period of time, they have ruined each other in so many ways and they've damaged the children in so many ways. Then one or both may involve themselves in an extramarital affair, which brings about a certain amount of pain and injury and uh, guilt, to say the least. And then when the decision is made, depending upon the state where you live, you, you go through a whole bunch of legalities in the court system. And then you try to sort out who is going to get everything. You know, who's going to get the children, who's going to get the dog, who's going to get the house. And it's not until the final decree comes that you have to deal with the emotional consequences of divorce. Once the decree is made, now you are divorced. You are no longer married. You are now divorced. And the legal separation occurs. Then the emotional detachment, the ripping and the tearing and the shredding begins. It takes some people as long as two years, some three, some five years to process the difficulties of the divorce situation before they can really be healed. But do you know what we think? 
you know, we just want to get so married so bad. We think, man, if I could just get married, everything is just going to be wonderful and I'm going to have a happy life. Well, hopefully that will be true. And if you set your marriage on biblical principles, then you, then it can be true. But if you don't, then you are looking for difficulty. And the difficulty escalates. And before you know it, you're going through this type of thing. Now, those of you who have been through divorce, you can affirm all of this. You can attest to it. You know that it's true. It's difficult. It's hard. It's ripping. It drains. Now, listen, if you get a divorce, it drains all your resources as an individual person. It drains all your resources financially, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, and the devil doesn't care. He never did. That's what it's all about, you see. That's what he was after. There is nothing, absolutely nothing more precious that God has given us on this earth in our marriage. Nothing more precious. But what do we do? Well, we have marriage problems and we just put a band-aid on them here. We put a band-aid on them there and just hope that it'll work out some way. But it doesn't. It's a disaster. Listen, if you have trouble in your marriage and you're not doing anything about it, you're headed for a train wreck. I thank God for the privilege that we have to work with couples all the time. And that is the most difficult thing to get them to understand. That if you have a problem, there is nothing more important than settling that problem because there's nothing more important and precious than your marriage. And if I can drive that home to you who are married and you begin to put your marriage first, you will then begin to experience that beautiful relationship that God has for you. And if you need help, get some help. I have never found any marriage that didn't need help somewhere along the line. They all do. Married life doesn't come natural. Every married person in this room will tell you that marriage is not natural. It's spiritual. It's true. It is spiritual. It's not natural. We've all tried it the natural way. It never works. And that's why when we come to the most important teaching on marriage in Ephesians 5, God says, first of all, be filled with the Spirit. Because you've got to trust in God. See, we can be single and we don't have any of these concerns and any pressure and we think that we are trusting in God. And then we get married and we find out now that, that we've got our eyes off of God and on the problem that we are married to. And it's really difficult for some then to put their, their trust now in God because they cannot trust the person maybe. But no matter what is happening in your marriage, if you put your faith in him and trust in him and really do that and seek him, then he helps you in those times of trouble and difficulty. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. We saw last time, one flesh primarily speaks of the sexual union. It speaks of much more than that, as we're going to see, but it's important to understand that in becoming husband and wife, a part of that relationship is sexual oneness, and they shall become one flesh. And God expects the husband and the wife to stay pure and true to each other in the marriage bond. Hebrews 13.4 says, Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. So when we become one flesh, it is to be with that woman or that man for the rest of our life unless death separates. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Save Genesis 2. We're going to come back. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 15. The Apostle Paul takes this further. 1 Corinthians 6, 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So when he says you shall become one flesh, he's talking about sexual union and sexual purity 
And he honors that in marriage. Now, outside of that, something happens. Wilt Chamberlain was one of our famous basketball players of years past. Before they found him dead in his apartment a couple of years ago, he had bragged about how he had 20,000 encounters with 20,000 different women. Now, that means 20,000 times he had broken God's word. 20,000 times he had become one flesh with another person, and he had prostituted his body. He violated God's principles, one man, one woman for life, unless death intercedes. So when he says, you shall become one flesh, this is a mystery. Some kind of bonding, something unique, something extraordinary takes place in the sexual relationship that is different from anything else that we ever experience in our lifetime. So he says, honor it only with your wife or with your husband and not with another person. It is very clear in God's word. Well, back to Genesis chapter 2. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now, the statement shall become one flesh means much more than just the sexual union. And that brings us to the goal of marriage. The goal of marriage is to become one. Now, someone said during the marriage ceremony, two become one. It's on the honeymoon they discover which one. That's a joke. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. That makes me feel a lot better. The becoming speaks of a process. A man and a woman do not become one on that day when they recite their vows and the pastor declares them husband and wife. It begins at that point and carries on in the weeks and the months and the years to follow. Marriage is a process of becoming and the goal is oneness. It speaks of two people who through love, devotion and commitment blend their lives together to make a new life together. They do not cease to be individuals, but their individuality is taken up into something bigger and better than the sum of the parts. Marriage, as God intended it, takes on a life of its own that adds to and enhances the life of the participants. Oneness is not dominating or being dominated, but each bringing the best and the worst of our individuality to the union. It involves the development of a new personality, if you will. We could call it a couple personality. When you get married, single friends trail off a little bit, and you feel awkward because there is now a new personality that's being developed. And young marriages, for the most part, have difficulty sometimes making new relationships with other people because they have the same awkwardness that they had as an individual moving into new situations. But this is God's design. In other words, that we are to leave and we are to cleave and we are to become one. It is more than a physical union, and you will experience it. There is an intimacy involved and a closeness with a husband and a wife relationship that is beautiful and wonderful. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now, just as a footnote here, go back to Genesis 1 and verse 27. Just should be a page back. Genesis 1 and verse 27. It says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Since we are made in his image, notice, male and female, he created them. Not man alone, not woman alone. Now, we know that there are differences, but it is not in our differences or our individuality that Christ and God are honored, but it's in our one plus one equals not two, but one. The original intent of male and female is for the two to become one. Male and female, he created them. God's plan is two becoming one. And it is particularly important to understand that today in, in our American culture. In New York in 1988, an appeals court judge ruled that a couple, male and male, could file for benefits from the state. And since 1988, several cities have passed these kinds of laws which say that the traditional quote-unquote family can be uh, sized up in other ways. That is, man living with man and woman living with woman. And so they qualify for health benefits and tax breaks and bereavement days off and things like that. And what is happening is that there has been a shift from what God said, male and female, into a culture determining something different from what God said. 
So what we are seeing is a breaking down of what God intended, the divine intention, man and woman, to all kinds of weird interpretations. It was God's intent for mankind to recognize the intent of separateness and individuality and the beauty and the oneness formed when male and female come together in marriage. When that happens, God is honored, a culture is strengthened, homes are blessed, and people can live in the joy and the happiness of life that God intends for man to have. So in marriage, we do not cease to be individuals, but our individuality is taken up into something bigger and better than the sum of the parts. Marriage, as God intended it, takes on a life of its own and adds to and enhances the life of the participants. Now, we have all experienced the, the reality of this one flesh dimension uh, of marriage in this way. I mean, think about the married people that you know. It's virtually impossible to think about one of them without thinking of their mate as well. And this is the way it ought to be. Now, there's another way to think of becoming one flesh that may help us to get a better grasp on the goal of marriage. To be one flesh means to be intimate. And to be intimate means to know and to be known. The essence of becoming one flesh is the process of growing in your knowledge of your mate and them growing in their knowledge of you. And that is why verse 25 has to be added to the equation at this point. Verse 25 says, And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now, this is not just merely an interesting postscript to the story of the creation of man, but it shows us the kind of intimacy that God desires for marriage. It is complete, holding nothing back, hiding nothing. Adam and Eve were, were, were without sin, and because of that, there was no shame and no guilt. So in their innocent they, innocence, they could be in one another's presence, completely one and transparent. Their nakedness, you see, went well beyond their bodies. It went to their souls. It wasn't until after the fall that they hid themselves and tried to cover their nakedness. They were so guilty and ashamed that they tried to hide from God. And when Adam was confronted with his sin, he shifted blame, as Eve did. But from the beginning, it was God's original plan that a husband and wife be one in a relationship unmarred and unhindered by guilt and shame. And the goal of the marriage of marriage is still the same. God desires a husband and a wife to be one, learning to love one another and to be committed to one another despite our faults and our weaknesses and our failures. You see, deep in every one of our hearts is the need to be known and to be loved despite our faults. And until we find that, loneliness will prevail. We long and we ache to go back to the garden from which we were banned by sin. Marriage is the place that God has given for us to discover what was lost in the garden. Marriage is the place that he has given for us to know and to experience the power of his love and forgiveness in terms of a relationship with someone else. And the fact of the matter is, is until we find that kind of intimacy, however halting and imperfect it may be, we will feel this sharp, piercing stab of loneliness. Now, as we saw last time, the purpose of marriage is to eliminate loneliness. But marriage itself does not guarantee an end to loneliness. could be that some of you are here this morning and you are married, but you are still very lonely. And all because you have not known or understood the purpose and the goal of marriage. Many couples get married because they fell in love. Isn't that something? I mean, that's what we do. We fall in love. It's like falling off a chair. I mean... You're sitting on it one day and then clunk, you're not sitting on it the next day. And you feel different lying there on the ground with a banged head and you're dizzy. And you have this feeling of incredible attraction. It is a feeling that makes you want to be with this, this person so much. You just want to be with them all the time, even, even forever. This other person just excites you so much. They make you feel so good. It's like the girl who wrote, I climbed up the door and I shut the stairs. I said my shoes and took off my prayers. I shut off my bed and climbed into the light, and all because he kissed me good night. You see, it's that feeling of, of incredible attraction. It is romantic love. But romantic love can only be maintained by a caring love that Ephesians chapter 5 speaks of. And if it isn't nurtured by a caring love, 
in a few years they say, well, you know, I, I, I think I made a mistake here. I don't, I'm not happy. I don't love you anymore. I don't have any feelings anymore. You see, they really didn't know why they got married in the first place. I just don't have any feelings anymore. Listen, you could spend 20 minutes with somebody and lose feelings for them really quick. It's true. When you don't live up to, uh, when they don't live up to your expert expectations and your needs are not being met and you don't know how to get them met. So now that those feelings have changed and cooled and in some cases passed, they wonder why they are still married. Because they got married based on a feeling, they fail to realize the incredible potential, potential that their marriage possesses. Feelings come and go. But genuine intimacy and the deep-seated sense of satisfaction and fulfillment that come from God's design for marriage is something that builds and grows over time and is only nurtured by a loyal commitment that is not hindered by feelings or the lack thereof. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. God wants us to become one in every area. That's his design for marriage. But Satan also has a design for marriage. And his basic plan for marriage is to bring division and separation and ultimately divorce. Now, that doesn't mean that behind every bush there's a red demon that jumps out and says, follow me, follow me. Satan is much more subtle than that. He gets hold of philosophies of life and he begins to use them in cultural settings to redirect people's viewpoints and their values. And he has been very, very clever in every culture. One of his beginning things for separation is to be married yet live a single lifestyle. And that is what is taught today. That's what television teaches. That's what every magazine you read teaches. That's what every book you read teaches. And so we have a lot of married singles. We have a lot of married Christian singles. Now, that describes two people who love each other or think they love each other or they're infatuated with each other. They live in the same house. They sleep in the same bed. They have sex together. And yet they live two separate lives. Now, if you are single and you want to get married, there are some questions you must ask yourself. We saw the first one last time. Do you remember what it was? The first one is, am I really ready to totally leave my mother and my father in every way, physically, financially, and emotionally? The next question you have to ask yourself is, are you ready to give up your singleness? Are you ready to give up your singleness? Now, a lot of people aren't. Or they would like all of the benefits that they think is in marriage, but they don't really want to give up their singleness. And I want to say to you that it is a big adjustment. It's a great adjustment. A lot of people are never prepared for it. It's difficult. And you can talk to people that have been married for any length of time and they'll tell you yes. Yes, it is. But I need to tell you that, that it can be a very difficult, wrenching experience and adjustment from singleness. I've counseled many people down through the years who have said, you know, I've been married for a long time and yet I just feel like I'm single. You know, I, and, and, and both men and women will say that. And they say, I feel like I'm single because of what my spouse is doing. That is just the opposite of what God desires. And when you stop and think about it, those of you who are married, you need to really examine this. Are you one? I mean, are you really? Are you doing things together? Do you think together? Do you make decisions together? Do you, through love and devotion and commitment, blend your lives together in absolutely every way possible? Or are you going your separate ways? A lot of people get married and they never make that adjustment. They never make that change. And a lot of them never intend to. They just remain the way they are before they got married. It's amazing how we can just go our own way. There are so many marriages, and I know some, where the couples are like two ships passing in the night. They eat together once in a while and they sleep together once in a while, but they both go their different ways. So if you're single and you desire to be married, the second question is, are you ready to give up your single lifestyle? Many marriages today are suffering greatly because one or the other partner has not done so. But oh, how God desires that for us. The next time we're going to be able now to go to the New Testament and, and see God's design for becoming one, begin to see that anyway, God's plan that we can apply and have our marriages be all that we ever dreamed for them to be. But before we conclude, we must look at one more thing regarding oneness. Now, as we have seen, 
It is God's plan that two people who through love, devotion, and commitment blend their lives together to make a new life together. But that is very difficult. In fact, it is impossible to do if there isn't a spiritual oneness. Just as there is a physical oneness and a blending of all of our lives together, there is also to be a spiritual oneness. In 2 Corinthians 6, 14, listen to what it says. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? Now this is saying that spiritually there can, cannot be a true oneness. Though there can be a sexual, a physical oneness, there cannot be spiritually a true oneness between a person who is a Christian and one who is not a Christian. Now, do you know what happens when a Christian marries a person who's not a Christian? It affects them in tremendous ways. Three ways that it affects them. First of all, it affects them upwardly. The believer, in the first place, is in rebellion against God when he or she marries an unbeliever because God specifically says, don't do it. When the believer says, I'm going to do it anyway, I don't care what God says, I'm going to do it, that is unbelief. That is rebellion against a principle of God's word, and it has an upward effect on them. You see, we cannot expect God's blessing when we disobey a principle and knowingly walk into it and don't do what God tells us. I was reading this week about Mark Twain. Mark Twain married a lady who was a committed Christian, and he called her Libby. And when they first got married, he would go to church with her occasionally, and he would read the Bible with her occasionally at the breakfast table. But after a while, he said, I, I don't want to go to church anymore. He said, I don't believe in the Bible. I never did. I don't believe in it at all. And that really discouraged her, and she quit reading it, and she quit going to church. And for some years, uh, and then some years went by, and they went through a, a tremendous personal tragedy. And she was having such a horrible time. And he was trying to comfort her, and he said, Libby, he said, why don't you just go back to your Christian faith and let that now comfort you? Because I can't. She said, I don't have it anymore. I don't have it anymore. Do you see? Twain had taken away that response that she had for God. She had married an unbeliever, and it had an effect upon her relationship personally with God. Well, there's a second effect that it has, and that is an inward effect. In other words, there's a lack of common purpose. Amos said, how can two walk together unless they be agreed? For instance, for the believer... Sunday is a holy day. For an unbelieving spouse, it is a holiday. For a believer, I want to bring an offering to the Lord. For an unbeliever, we're not going to give anything to that church. For a believer, I want to worship the Lord. For an unbeliever, let's sleep in today. For a believer, I want to pray. For the unbeliever, I don't believe in prayer. So there's this constant struggle inwardly between the believer and the unbeliever, and that struggle puts a tremendous strain on the relationship with each other and with God. But also it has an effect that we sometimes don't think about, and that is that it has an outward effect. The outward effect can be seen in the relationship and the strain that it puts on people who love them. For instance, Samson went uh, against his parents' wishes, and he chose a woman in another country. She wasn't Jewish. Uh, she wasn't a Hebrew. And his parents had talked to him about it, and yet he went to another country and picked another woman, just like Esau did. Both of them were known for their rebellion, and because they rebelled against God, they got in trouble, and they put tremendous stress on their relationship with their parents and their family. And it does exactly the same thing today with Christian parents. To say nothing of the outward effect or the difficulty that it poses to unequally yoked parents in trying to raise their children. Now, I realize that there are possibly some here today who are thinking, you know, I, I really messed up. I, I did not marry a Christian. Now, some of you did not know because you became a Christian after you were married. Or maybe you did, not, you did know Christ at that time, but you were living away from God, you were backsliding, you were, you, you were doing your own thing, and you were in a place of rebellion against God. You went your own way and you did your own thing. Well, what should you do? Well, first of all, admit that you have sinned. Say, Lord, I blew it. I confess I'm responsible. I take responsibility. Secondly, know that God forgives you. 
There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. He's not going to exact a pound of flesh from you. He loves you and he will forgive you. And then thirdly, begin to pray for the conversion of your spouse. Peter in 1 Peter chapter 3 says, don't nag that spouse. Don't bug them, but just simply live the beautiful life in front of them and pray for them. Thank God that through the years we have seen husbands and wives who were unbelievers come to faith in Jesus Christ and join their loved ones in beautiful oneness. Don't be like Libby Twain. Keep your faith. And if you are not married, make a commitment right now that you will only marry a believer. Matthew Henry, who wrote one of the great commentaries on Scripture, was a tremendous young Christian man, and he was in love with a young lady whose father was a very wealthy socialite. And she asked her father for permission to marry Matthew Henry. And this is what her dad said. He said, well, he said, I don't know what stock he comes from. I do not know about his social position. I'm not sure about how I feel about his possibilities. Where is he from? And this young lady, with tremendous insight, said, Daddy, it's not so important where he is from, but I know where he is going, and I want to go with him. And when you marry a believer, you know where they are going, and you want to go with them. So when God's word says, we become one flesh, he not only wants us to have a wonderful, fulfilling sex life, he not only wants us to, through love, devotion, and commitment, blend our lives together into one He also wants us to have a spiritual oneness. And that, by the way, is what happens when you are converted. When we come to Christ, what happens? We become one with Christ. Until then, we're not agreeing with him. But when we agree that we are sinners and that we cannot save ourselves and that we need Christ, then we come and trust him. And then we are one with Christ. So you are not if you are not a believer you are not married to Christ. When we become believers, we become the bride of Christ. That's the metaphor that's used in the scripture about his relationship with us, with his church, with his family. So there is is oneness there, a beautiful oneness when we come to Christ. And God desires that we would experience that same kind of beautiful oneness in our marriage. That's God's design. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your design for marriage. We're thankful for marriage today. So thankful, Lord, for what you have given us, the most precious thing that you've given us here on earth, the most precious, wonderful relationship. I pray, Father, you continue to minister to all of our hearts. So thankful that you know every heart here. You know what everyone is thinking, what everyone is going through. You know every marriage. You know exactly where we are. And it's wonderful to know that in your grace, in your love, in your mercy, you want all of our marriages to be what you have designed them to be. And it's wonderful to know that if we apply your word to our lives, that they can become that. And I pray, Lord, I thank you for all the wonderful marriages here in our church. I pray, Father, that you would help each one, Lord, in this process of oneness. That you would help each one to look to your word. And that we would be not just hearers of your word only, but we would be doers of your word. And we know, Lord, that with your strength and your power backing us, with your help, we can do just that. Lord, for the marriages that are struggling here today, Pray your blessing upon them and that you would help them, Father, to look to your word. And Lord, for those that have made mistakes in the past, I pray, Father, that you would just minister to their hearts right now how much you love them and how precious they are to you and your wonderful forgiveness for them. Thank you, Lord. As you have forgiven us and as you love us, help us, Lord, to do the same thing in our marriage, to be forgiving and to be loving above all things. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.